think uh, we have met earlier, is it? Yes, K I think is it IDFC or yeah, KC, KC yeah. Sivaram Ramakrishnan, yeah. When KC was alive, yeah. Yes. How are you? In fact, so I'm fine. So, so good day, to see you. Someone from Shimla was joining. I figured it must be you. Yeah, I'm so good to I'm so good to see you. Yeah, long That's long time. Thing. Yeah. Great. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth session of this belief series. Uh, we currently have uh, about 50 plus participants and I'm sure that more of them will join in. So I'll just take the first two, three minutes to uh, give everybody who's attended the introduction and set the context. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I'm hoping that everyone else who's registered will also be here. Yellargu um, namaskara, swagata, ee Sanjay karyakramake. Ivatu nao charche narso vishya yeyino andre. ಒಂದು ಚುನಾವಣೆ ಪ್ರಚಾರವನ್ನು ಹೇಗೆ ನಡೆಸೋದು ಈ ಸ್ಥಳೀಯ ಮಟ್ಟದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಟ್ ದ ಲೋಕಲ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಒಂದು ಚುನಾವಣೆ ಅಭ್ಯರ್ಥಿ ಆಗಿ ನಿಲ್ಲುವಾಗ ಒಂದು ಅಭ್ಯಾ ಅಭಿಯಾನವನ್ನು ನಡೆಸೋದು ಹೇಗೆ ಅದನ್ನ ಹೇಗೆ ಆಯೋಜಿಸೋದು ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ವಿಭಿನ್ನ ಅಂಶಗಳು ಏನೇನಿರುತ್ತೆ ಈ ಎಲ್ಲ ವಿಷಯಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಚರ್ಚೆ ಮಾಡೋಣ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ದ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರನ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅನ್ ಎಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಪೇನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋ ಫಾರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬಿಲೀಫ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ದ ಬಿಲೀಫ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಬ್ರಾಟ್ Um, to everybody by Bengaluru Navanirmana Party. The belief series stands for BNP enabling learning in every function of BNP, of BBMP. Uh, so far, the focus has been on some technical aspects which include uh, learning on the finances, on the BBMP Act, on how the wards are mapped and structured. So our uh, viewers have um, gone through some objective um, information and learning modules. Today is a very uh, unique um, uh, panel, a unique conversation that we have uh, put together. Uh, which will speak about uh, the background of election management and campaigning. So those of you who haven't uh, heard from me before, my name is Rishwan Jas Raghavan. I'm a student of economics and uh, public policy. And for the last two years, I've worked at uh, different levels uh, of governance with political representatives. Um, and this is my interest. My focus currently is local governance. And I'm here trying to work to see if we can get as many youngsters as possible into the system, be it even contesting elections. That's why I'm here. Uh, I will be moderating and uh, taking you all through um, today's panel. Um, today we have tried to create a very politically neutral space where we look at the background aspects of just election campaigns um, so that any well-meaning citizens who want to participate in the process of democracy can do so and we can create this knowledge pool for them. So our attendees today include a wide range, um, you know, from, right from students, resident welfare association members to different citizen groups to volunteers and political party members uh, across ideologies who want to really understand the background aspects of uh, running a campaign. So considering our objective, we are really fortunate to have um, uh, such a panel today con consisting of, you know, Dr. Ashwin Mahesh, who has been an urbanist, politician, journalist, and a long, uh, you know, list of accomplishments that I've come to in some time, uh, as well as Mrs. Shil Shilpa Pawar, who has been a political consultant, has co-founded her own um, organization called My Neta, which is into uh, political management, um, and also Mr. Tikender uh, Pawar. Sorry, Rishi, it's Smart Neta. Sorry, Smart Neta, yeah. And uh, Mr. Uh, Tikender Ji, who has been, you know, a directly elected uh, deputy mayor of the Shimla Municipal Corporation. Um, so we are really fortunate to have all of you here today and I extend a warm welcome to you. Um, the last thing that I want to say before we um, start off is the logistical part for all our viewers. Um, in this session, um, I will be giving a detailed, a slightly more detailed introduction before each speaker. Um, what we will do is each speaker will present a 15 minute uninterrupted um, uh, speech on their thoughts on our theme, which is uh, citizen um, connect and aspects of running a political campaign. And uh, I'll just probably give them a gentle reminder when there's two minutes to go. Um, after that, uh, once we are done with all the three speakers uh, one by one, we will then open it up um, to questions. So I'll be serving as an active moderator. Everyone might not get the opportunity to speak, but do put your questions throughout the session in the Q&A window and I will uh, pick and choose, maybe even club uh, questions so that they fit into the larger flow that we have planned for this this theme. So um, I think without uh, any more uh, ado, we'll have the uh, first speaker, which is uh, Dr. Ashwin Mahesh. Uh, he's someone who truly needs no 
introduction, especially here in Bangalore in the context that we have. Um, he is a technologist, public policy researcher. Uh, he's been studying the way cities are growing in India. And um, he, in fact, started off, you know, studying to be an astronomer uh, and a climate scientist. He's worked with NASA. And, um, you know, after that, when looking at urban development, he's uh, been a faculty member, researcher at Indian Institute of Management. He's also been associated with Indian Institute of Information Technology. Um, he, his organization, uh, MapUnity, which is a, a social technology lab, has, you know, worked on several development challenges. Um, a lot of popular, uh, you know, initiatives in Bangalore, including, you know, the Big Ten bus services, or be it the first, uh, you know, digital uh, initiative, which, you know, he led, organized with the Bangalore Traffic Police um, to, you know, restri restoring of lakes. There's a wide list of, you know, accomplishments and achievements of his, which no matter how hard I try, I will not be able to cover in its entirety. So I might have missed out on so many other important things, but uh, I will, you know, restrict myself here and hand it over to him. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank, thank you, Rishi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK, so uh, I want to share my screen. Can you, do you need to do something to enable that? I should be enabled for you. Okay, hold on. So no, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. That's why I asked for it. OK, let me see now, no. How about now? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is it? I'm, I'm trying to find here. Okay. So I have uh, only a few slides, and um, so I'll I'll go through those. Can you see it on full screen, or is it? Uh, it's not on full screen yet. Yeah. Now it should. Now be it is. Okay. So yes, I have only a few slides. And I thought what I would do is point to the things that I believe have changed in the last 10 years in particular, since, um, since we first began to push for a different kind of governance and for a different kind of politics in cities in particular. And, and essentially, my goal in this presentation is very simple, to draw attention to why things, how things are different, but also to say why things are di different and what the implications of that difference are for the politics of urban areas in particular, but more broadly for the politics of the country as everywhere we are urbanizing now. Um, so thank you to... Uh, Bengaluru Navanirman party for organizing this discussion. I think these are important discussions to have. So let me get to the point. So I have a theory of change. And, and if you're in Bangalore, you probably heard this theory of change from me in some place or the other. I think that we, we can't really know the solutions to a lot of complex problems. Complex problems have such breadth and depth and diversity and variance that really, if we have to put our trust in something that can solve complex problems, we are better off trusting people. And so I've been working with this theory that rather than trying to find solutions, we must try and increase the number of problem solving people. And this has been an important part of the way I have tried to intervene in the city uh, and, and an important part of how some things have even happened in the city. In my mind, a lot of this sort of goes back to, I'm gonna say about, well, this is the picture on the left is from December, 2010. This is the start of the first anti-corruption rally that we did uh, during the time of the Lokaita investigation into corruption in mining, in particular, in Karnataka. And uh, it, was a, it was a nice sunny day in December. It was a great day for protesting, as I like to say. And it was in Common Park in, the, in sort of in December. It was really a wonderful time. And a lot of people who, who were in sort of politics, I wouldn't say politics, in public, trying to, in, in public life and trying to influence things, uh, showed up, but also many others 
who have never really been part of public advocacy of something showed up. And, um, and as you can see, you know, Arvind's there, JP's there, and also some other interesting people. Mohan was there, Mohan Das Pai is there, Ashwini Natsapal is there. So it's, we, were, we sort of had an eclectic collection of people who each in their own way might have done something to push the boundaries of public problem solving, but were now coming together at a, in, in a way that they had not previously done at an anti-corruption plan. Right? And, uh, and we sort of, it sort of grew from there in a sense that uh, from, by the end of the India Against Corruption campaign, it has it become almost natural that uh, the only way to really take this forward is in politics itself. There were those like me who, I mean, I was in Lok Sattva and, and, and had already accepted that change making is a political process. Many others were also in Lok Sattva, in Bangalore at that time. And we, therefore, one of the things that I found was a, a large number of the people who came to these sorts of events uh, in campaigns against corruption were also the sort of people who are now more willing to campaign positively for change as well, not just in protest mode, but also in advocacy mode in political campaigns, right? And I, I was quite interesting. They were comfortable being partisan, that wearing the label of one party. And in fact, they did not feel that wearing the label of one party made them less acceptable or less welcome in other spaces, which is a problem that a lot of people have. A lot of people say, oh, if I stand too close to one party or if I become partisan in one way, then you know it's difficult to be heard by others. Actually, the opposite is true. Almost everybody who is heard is partisan, and that's why they are heard. Um, and, and, and so we need to get over this feeling. But suddenly we were, we were seeing the beginnings of a very different style of campaign politics. And that's really what I want to talk about here. So I, these, these are basically the seven points that I want to go through. We started, the, the first thing that I think was, was different from the time we set out in elections was this idea of door-to-door -door canvassing, right? Um, I, I, I assume that some version of it has existed always. I don't think uh, it was not there, but I think the kind of door-to-door -door canvassing that now goes on in cities is very different from what was there previously. Um, even now, uh, I'm gonna say traditional parties tend to do drive-throughs in a neighborhood. They tend to sort of come by a locality, sometimes congregate in a, in a, in a, in a central location, uh, and invite a lot of people to come to that. Uh, but this business of going to every person's door and talking to every potential voter one-on-one, -on -one, um, I think that's really changing the nature, not only of the campaign itself, but it's also changing the nature of what we expect as outcomes from new election campaigns. This also means that a lot of people in such canvassing mode are volunteers. Right, it's it's it, it, the guy, the people who are not volunteers uh, cannot really talk to the voter. This is, you know, this is, and, and I'm not saying this. You have to be a progressive-minded volunteer to go talk to a voter. You can be any, you can have any ideology, but if you are not a believer yourself in the thing that you are advocating and campaigning for, you can't talk to the voters one on one. You can conduct rallies, you can organize some groups of them to support you, but one-on-one -on -one conversation with voters requires volunteers who believe that they are campaigning for things that they agree with and who can themselves you know, behave as advocates of the thing that they are campaigning for. The third thing is that now there's a lot more middle-class participation. People like, quote unquote, your name, uh, are more and more willing to go out on the street, go door to door in, in different kinds of neighborhoods, talk to voters. Whereas historically, the middle class in many elections either stayed away completely from elections or participated in a way that was largely among itself. 
it, it engaged largely within itself, it, it held fewer conversations, and its participation was limited to really times that were very close to election day itself. As a result of this extensive contact with individual voters by volunteer teams and political parties, you are seeing the emergence of very local, high, even hyper-local and issue-based politics. Um, you, you know, people, people are talking about not just the usual things about you know, road conditions and street lights and things like that, but you know, public spaces. We've seen this with lakes here in Bangalore, right? Um, lots of people are involved in the revival of public spaces. Lots of people are involved in um, sustainability related initiatives, waste management, all sorts of things. The issues are coming up for discussion more and more among the people themselves, partly because they are getting discussed far more in campaigns. Right? And partly they're getting discussed partly more in campaigns because individual voters now have an opportunity to tell volunteers of a political party what they really care about. And, and so this is a, self, a cycle that feeds on itself. But, the, but there are also other things that have happened as a result of the way campaigns are, are, are being carried out. One is that we now have longer campaigns. The longer campaigns started off among new parties, Lok Sata initially, then with Amadmi Party, as a way of creating political mind space. The voters don't know you. So you can't expect to have a short campaign. The election commission actually has set up an election process in which voters don't learn much. The, notif the, the time available between notification and election is so short that virtually the voters have no good opportunity to learn the candidates. And despite many calls to lengthen the campaign period, the election commission has not done that. So what has happened is that those who want voters to know them have simply started the election campaign ahead of time, even before the notification from the election commission. So you essentially say, look, I know the election is in December, I'm gonna start the campaign in April or May or June. I don't really care if they issue a notification only in November. And this is especially easy for uh, seats where last minute changes and delimitation, reservation, et cetera, is not an issue. That if you are a willing candidate, you can actually begin to campaign to contest a constituency long before the actual election. Longer campaigns have resulted, and some people have sort of criticized this by saying this longer campaigns have become almost like an always in campaign mode kind of politics. And there are people in our politics who spend, seem to spend a far larger amounts of time campaigning than actually governing, even if they were to win. And this has been sort of pointed out as uh, one of the things that has resulted from this new style of campaigning, uh, but you can say that maybe that was also always there. It's just sort of going through a process of coming to its own average over time. The other thing that's clearly different now is social media. Right? Social media has, has, within a space of six to 10 years, gone from being a useful tool to potentially the dominant space in which narratives about elections are carried out, and or at least a very strong complement to what happens on the ground. And unfortunately, social media includes capabilities, machine-driven capabilities, which are not really healthy in, and which are not really reflective of how societies interact among themselves. In the real world, you do not become a member of 3,500 groups and send a broadcast message to all of them. But in the digital world, you can. And so it's a very different kind of social engagement itself. Um, and because of that, it, the way in which it influences how we think, influences how we talk to each other about issues that we hear about is very different. It's, it's a useful lever, but it's also a very big responsibility. And there are tremendous concerns that this responsibility is not taken seriously by a lot of political persons in particular. 
And this is something that is both new since 2010, and while potentially strong, also potentially risky. What all of this has meant, you know, continuing engagement, longer campaigns, issue-based politics, spectrum of participation across different groups in society and different classes and different uh, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds. What all of this has meant is that now there is a responsibility to recruit better and train better for politics as well. And BNP itself, I'm sure, is going through one version of this to find candidates for what it would like to do. I, so this is my last slide. So for this, I essentially, we actually try to structure this, recruit better and train better by setting up the Bangalore Political Action Committee. The Political Action Committee is an interesting effort. I think the notion of a PAC is quite widespread elsewhere in the world, um, and, and, but it's still quite new in India. And even after BPAC got set up, and you don't see too many other political action committees uh, around the country where people who are normally and not themselves politicians, nonetheless self-organize for advocacy in the political space and to drive a particular agenda. Uh, BPAC was, is an ongoing and interesting experience, experiment. And I think the most powerful part of BPAC is the BCLIP class where students, you know, a hundred students a year with active political intent, and that's important. These are not just students who are learning for the sake of learning these things, but they are students with active political intent are learning how the city functions, are learning about different agencies of the city, their budgets, their responsibilities, their limitations, uh, their failures, their finances, all of these things, and in a very systematic way. And this is by the design of the course, it is engaged, it is designed to be participatory as well in the communities where these students come from. These learners are required to produce the signatures of a hundred supporters in their own ward, even to be enrolled in the course. They are required to do work in the ward as part of the course itself and subsequent course. So the very act of creating a course like this has, has, has created a little bit of an engine by which a hundred people each year are being added to the possible roles of candidates for the future. And that's really interesting because there are only 200 candidates in municipal elections, I mean 200 wards. So you're creating two and a half candidates per municipal cycle per ward if by simply going through this. And stop here. I, what I really wanted to lay out is just this canvas of how the urban campaign space is changing and how it is increasingly becoming linked to a more active and issue-driven and informed politics. And that's a good thing whether we can create transformative change by that that's the question that we have to answer for ourselves next. great thank you so much sir for the brilliant context setting it's a great way to start our session today i'll keep my intervention as short as possible a reminder to everyone that if you have any questions do start putting them on the um, q a box and i look forward to come back to sir during the q a session um, i now quickly move over to our uh, next panelist uh, Mrs. Shilpa, who um, you know, will be speaking about the role of technology and data when it comes to election campaigning, which is a great next move after the context that we've been through. Um, a quick introduction about her. She did her MBA and HRM from the University of Swinburne in Australia, uh, started as an entrepreneur. She is now the co-founder of Smart Neta, which is a data and political intelligence company, which helps a huge range of political parties and candidates uh, use technology for the process of elections. Um, she's also contested in the BBMP elections before uh, on an entirely crowdfunded campaign. And she's been a part, an active part of the NGOs like the Citizen Actions Forum and the Beak Pack that we just heard about. Um, and she's also been through the BeeClip, uh, the Civic Leadership Incubator program herself. Uh, she's been an active citizen, worked on a wide range of issues like uh, waste management, women's safety, health, education. She's also worked with many departments of the BBMP, the Traffic Police, Forest Department, Lake Development Authority, and so on. Um, so her approach uh, towards politics has widely been recognized and lauded. And um, over 
to you, uh, ma'am, the next 15 minutes um, so that you can take us through your presentation. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rishi. And uh, thank you, Srikant and uh, Bangalore uh, Navanirmana Party. And uh, uh, Dr. Rashwin Mahesh was here and uh, Tikendra Panwarji. So I'm so glad and happy to be part of this session today. Here, uh, in every coming years and decades, we see changes for improvement and betterment in handling human resource and technology in various sectors, um, like agriculture, textile, banking, hotels, small scale and large scale industries. When I say changes, um, it's all about adapting a new innovative technologies, which has made the processes very easy and time saving. But there is one such sector, uh, which is highly un uh, unorganized and unstructured, and that comes to the political campaigns in India. So why all these political campaigns has become so challenging in implementation? There could be few reasons here. No, I'll just mention a few of them. Like uh, starting, like, you know, it all starts with the time period given to the candidate to campaign. Uh, it's just announced 30 to 45 days uh, prior. That's the maximum period a candidate gets. And very less time and few information about their geographies or boards and constituencies they are contesting. Again, the reason, as uh, Dr. Rashmin Mahesh said, uh, no, it's all the reservation based process. So we need that to get in the right place. You know? And uh, somebody has to take a call on it and you know, decide uh, how to and what to do about it. And the traditional method of campaigning has become the priority here. Like money, caste, religion. That's all these people right now are implementing uh, you know, when it comes to the campaign. The other reasons are highly unorganized atmosphere of working. Um, as noticed, there is no specific roles defined, no accountability, no transparency in work. The budgeting um, is not in place. The finances exceed, exceed uh, when it comes to the uh, political campaigns. Working with unstructured data, like uh, you, know, you must be knowing, like uh, they do not know what to do, how to do, and where to do it. So going forward, like, um, um, and uh, this kind of a dilemma situation, we can always look for new way of campaigning in political world. If we see the elections outside India, they are way forward using data science and technologies. Now, data science and technologies help political parties and candidates to enhance their productivity efficiency and effectivity. Now this brings 15% of cost saving in their campaign budgets and up to additional five to 8% vote swings. So this is one of the studies of our client we have done you know, in India or in Bangalore. At a constituency level that is approximately rupees three crore campaign cost saving and additional 10,000 votes can be secured. Can you imagine this using data science and technology. Now let's come on to the governance side. Technology can help to restructure themselves with the best practice of SOPs. This can help the candidates, local parties to regionally grow from regional parties to the state level, from the state level to the national level and at the national level to remain dominant. A party is a sum of the energies of its members. To channel these energies of members in the right and consistent manner, SOP guidelines and technology can contribute hugely. So I know the term sounds uh, kind of complicated here, like when I say data and you know, analytics and you know, the technology. So data is, uh, data is the word for the information and data science or analysis and analyzing all the information in a structured way to come with the logical inferences and projections. These information can be demographic profiling, past tendencies, cognitive behavior, geolocation behavior, sentiments of voters. Now, as a um, technology part of it has given candidates the opinion, sorry, option to the diversify their approaches potentially to large target uh, no, groups of 
the strong supporters and uh, swing vote pools. The rise in this digital platform, especially like, uh, as mentioned, social media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagrams, okay, and the survey apps with uh, geotagging the voters, performance tracking volunteers, influencers group, geofence marketing SMSs, voice calls, WhatsApp, including media channels are gaining political leverage over these competitors today. So why is this all important? Election and governance is a very resource intensive activity. Through data analytics and technology, we can help political parties and candidates to guide on topics, geographies, and voters. With we have, which uh, no, I have defined it as three Ws. What to do, where to do, whom to focus. Now, what if data science and technology will unleash the true power of democracy more and more. People from grassroots who have great idea and leadership will be able to connect the masses without necessarily needing to garner the large funds here. So good governance will become a prerequisite. Issue-based politics will be the new normal. Every country and as well the global level there are robust frameworks of data security and interportability being defined. Implementation of the same will reduce data misuse. So if we focus on these tools and solutions to improve the efficiency and set up a war room, bring software platforms like digital media, social media, few survey apps, analytical apps, we can see a big change in enabling good campaign management. So this is what I have to say, Rishi, over to you. Great, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, taking us through the possibilities uh, with technology and how it relates to campaign management. Um, look forward to coming back to you as well during the Q&A session. Um, I now would like to um, introduce our next speaker uh, Tikender Ji, who was the directly elected deputy mayor of Shimla city. Um, he has been able to create um, and work with a you know, vision, a development plan that's focusing on inclusive growth, on social infrastructure and trying to make the city and its citizens resilient. Um, over his term, he also had to work on environmental and ecology issues because that, that was a major area of concern. Um, he's also been working on strengthening ward sabhas and empowering the local ward committees. Uh, in fact, he was also a member of the National Task Force um, of India, which reviewed the 74th Constitutional Amendment, uh, which was speaking about decentralized governance in the first place. So, um, I mean, apart from this, he's represented the city and the country in a huge range of events, which I will not be able to cover. But he's been in uh, delegation, delegations to countries like South Africa, to China, uh, where there have been a lot of fellowships, discourses, conferences on urbanization, on cities. Um, and um, I think I will now uh, invite uh, Sir to take the floor for the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so far, I think um, we've had a, a Bangalore-centric context. We've also had some uh, information coming in on you know campaigns from this part. Now over to Sir for a more anecdotal uh, you know presentation on his take on yeah. campaign management and elections. Over to okay. you, Sir. Uh, thank you, Rishwanjus and. It was lovely to hear uh, one of my friends, Ashwin Maheji. Uh, uh, it's been long, and at least you brought us together on this platform. Uh, I hope I'm audible there, no? Yeah. Yes, okay. all thank great. You, thank you. So I do not know how to actually contextualize, uh, uh, you know, my experiences to the president. This is a new discussion to me. And uh, someone who's always been on the streets fighting uh, on urban issues, uh, finding alternatives to actually contextualize and structure discussion on uh, management of elections. I mean, it's slightly uh, problematic for me, but well, I'll try to do some justice uh, in, in, in the next uh, course of say, eight or 10 minutes or 15 minutes that you say. Uh, but I, I think before, before just go into the management, because I come from a different uh, 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 lens. I mean, I view cities and elections and politics from a different lens. To me, uh, elections is a tool to actually 
uh, transform for a better living, for better livelihoods. That's how I view uh, politics to be. And that's why I'm a professional, what we call in our, uh, I mean, what we in our term, a professional uh, revolutionary. I mean, someone who's there, I mean, who's, uh, who does nothing except uh, working uh, in, in, in the urban realm to just get this transformation uh, more vibrant. So uh, yeah, so so I think uh, that's why it's it's a little problematic for me because uh, you know uh, uh, I mean just uh, contextualizing this discussion uh, is a real challenge. Yeah. So uh, so as I've said, but I think before I just go into how the elections are fought, how they are contested, and as Ashwinji has very rightly pointed out, especially in the last ten years, I would say even more than that. Well, I I I think there's a purpose why he mentioned ten years, but I think even before. Uh, this there's a transformation that is taking place according to me in the cities especially in the last three decades of the period what i call you know the cities uh, being run under neoliberal capitalism which means that cities are now being and, and actually there's a fallout to it and there's a fallout for on elections there's a fallout how elections are being fought i mean otherwise how would you uh, uh, explain that you know the home minister uh, entering a city like hyderabad okay and saying Look, I mean, can you imagine a home minister uh, campaigning for the municipal corporation elections in Hyderabad? So, you, I mean, so, so, I mean, we must uh, keep that in mind. So, and in and and in these three decades, actually, what has happened? I think the few important uh, changes that we witness: a that cities are now considered as, of course, the earlier also they were uh, they were considered as. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a transformation in in, in city. Uh, management from city managers, what we call, you know, you to manage a city. So there's a state that is going to take care of this. That's why you had the 74th constitutional amendment. And but now this transformation has taken place from city managers to city entrepreneurs. So what does this mean? So cities are being treated as uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a, as an as an enterprise, whereby cities have to compete each other to attract investments and to ensure that uh, that is the major driving force. But it has its own fallout. Uh, as I, and as I said, that uh, this is part of that uh, larger neoliberal capitalism that we were witnessing in the country, and cities were like the the major uh, core areas. So this has also led to certain um, uh, changes, and that those changes in the society. For for for, for, for the simple uh, uh, Rishwan, just I'm, uh, I'm I'm pointing this out because you know when you say connect, the politics cannot be disconnected from the issues. So you know the issues that are being thrown up. Uh, and and there is a complete uh, binary between uh, what the larger political parties, for me, uh, the, the larger political parties which are wedded to uh, to the sustainability of this neoliberal capitalism, uh, what for them cities mean, and also politics is quite uh, inherently uh, integrated to uh, to the way they want to govern cities and what what is the reason why they want to govern cities for whom as I, as I pointed out uh, I mean, it's more of uh, that entrepreneur uh, I mean, entrepreneurial uh, mindset and actually uh, none else because this I've been quoting several places but I would think because we have a new uh, audience here I mean they must also be aware actually we more I don't know most of us uh, who were there in Akito in Habitat 3, when you're discussing, you know, those sustainable goals, because those are very important goals that we discuss in the cities. I mean, will the city be sustainable? And I think six or seven goals of the uh, SDGs are linked to uh, to the city uh, city model. So, uh, so there, I think, that, I mean, there was a clarion call that, hey, I mean, for heaven's sake, we have to come out of, uh, you know, this whole business of uh, uh, Les Ferry, that means free market economy, cities being treated as uh, entrepreneurs and cities just meant for attracting investments, uh, you know, land monetization, uh, for real estate development, uh, not for the people, I mean, that uh, of course means, and that, that's what John Gloss was pointing out time and again, that we have to go back to the basics of planning. So when I say this, Rishwan, just like, this is very important for people like me or maybe for a party like BNP who have to think out of the box. If they continue to continue to think within that the same framework and within the same uh, 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 contours that have been drawn, that you know you also uh, will treat city as an entrepreneur, as as a place which will attract investment. I think then uh, then we are bound to land in the same uh, in, in in the same ditch as as we are witnessing in the last. 
last three decades. So now quickly what has happened in the, in the last three decades, and that's how I think uh, that, that would be something very important for. A, I think uh, what has happened is that, uh, 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 what we are witnessing is that the way cities are being uh, planned, the way cities, uh, the solutions are being suggested. Uh, now these, these are the anecdotal experiences I will share. And you, and you asked me to show, share those anecdotal experiences because I, I was a directly elected deputy mayor of Simla. And the party that I come from, the Communist Party of India, Marxist, both the mayor and the deputy mayor were from uh, one party, but we had only two councillors in a council of 25. So you can imagine how herculean it was to run a city council, but we managed for five years. We, we, we actually uh, served the city for five years. So now I say, when I say this nexus, I think this is very important because this is what has, what has actually transformed. And this, this is the nexus that exists between your large consultancy firms who would come, hey, you don't know how to serve. And, and those are the anecdotal experiences that one should learn, uh, that you do not know how to run a city. So we will actually draw your plans. Now, when I say plans, I and mean, this is what the alternative, uh, especially for BNP, how and what uh, Ashwin was mentioning, I mean, more people, more people engaging, more people in this dialogue. So we will prepare your city development plan, we will prepare your city sanitation plan, we will prepare your city mobility plan. And then, you know, the poor cities say, hey, but we don't have the money. So they say, don't worry, we'll take the money from the center because that's that's how the things have been devised. So they'll take a grant from the center, they will prepare those city development plans, city sanitation plans, and the poor council who doesn't even know what these plans are, would pass it in a hurry and say, okay, let's pass these plans because then the, the investment is going to come. So you understand what I'm saying? So there is this, this nexus and the investment is also related. And majority of these plans, I would say, in fact, most of these plans are all capital intensive. So you will find, that's why I tell me one of the reasons, I mean, when we speak about alternative politics and that is related to alternative uh, forms of in which we have to manage the elections, I think why is it that almost 80 to 90% of your solid waste man management plants are not running? Because most of these plants do not work in a decentralized democratic uh, 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 you know, design, but are all said capital intensive technology. And for, they, they take tipping fees for five years, for, for seven years, and then they just run off. And most of these plants are not running because the city sanitation plan would be prepared by some consultant. There's a nexus with, this, with the state government and the nexus happens with the city government, gets a grant. And so just, just one anecdotal experience I'm talking about. Then you have similar mobility plans. So you'll find, and you said that comes to, uh, to I mean, when, when, when you say issues, so uh, the complete encroachment of uh, the uh, of, of the large guzzlers into into cities, and I don't know how Bangalore is facing that, but you know encroachment on spaces of uh, the, uh, what I call the urban commons, spaces of this uh, of, of, of cyclists or pedestrians. Why is it that all city mobility plan speak, speaks about you know widening the roads, bringing in those flyovers? Because again, there's an excess one who prepares the plan because the, the city government doesn't even have the capacity. So that, that capacity is also important. I mean, can we, uh, uh, as an alternative, develop that capacity when we are fighting elections? Can we build that at least, at least can we just catch the imagination of the people when, when we are building such an alternative? I think that is something where we have to ponder uh, over it. And there, there, there are experiences, for example, I can mention two you know, campaigns uh, in the elections. Uh, one is, uh, I'm a real fan of what the Barcelona people did. I mean, you know, when, when, they, when, when they brought in this whole slogan of for the urban commons, and they said, hey, I mean, this is a complete, I mean, robbing of uh, urban commons that is taking place. So, so let's win Barcelona. And similarly, when we were in Montreal, there's a complete, and you know, when I speak about Montreal and Barcelona, and these are not the major political parties I'm talking about. I'll come to the major political parties, how they actually completely uh, 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 overpower, you know, smaller parties or individuals and the kind of resources they have. I'll back it for a little later for the discussion. But the point is, these two cities, I mean, they were able to build in those alternatives because in Montreal, it was, you know, they have to work on alternative mobility and Barcelona, it was for the urban commons. So let's win Barcelona. And I do not remember the slogan, but it was, it, it was I think, Montreal belongs to us, something like that. So, so that alternative, what Ashwin was also mentioning, I think, so that management, See, there are no shortcuts, by the way, which, I mean, in, in politics. I mean, you can't imagine that all of a sudden the election is around. And so as you were saying, long term, I would say it's, it's a life term. It's a life term to change the polity. It's a life term task to be, to be in that continuity phase. And when I say in the continuity phase, I think 
that is linked to better our livelihoods. That is linked to what, what I said earlier. So I think the three things that I were talking about, one is uh, what has happened is that more capital intensive technology that, that, that is being co-faced. So I think for, for an alternative politics, that alternative has to be built. Like I am also interested to write the vision document. It's almost final for Ladakh. So Ladakh, we are really fighting with the main with the mainstream discourse because, uh, and um, uh, maybe if, if if there are Q and A's, we I'll, I'll take those questions. How the challenge exists between you know the main discourse on uh, water management because there is there is a push for for large capital intensive technologies where we are pushing for uh, you know uh, decentralized form uh, water through gravity where the capital cost would be extremely low. I mean, in comparison to the kind of uh, so, so I, I, I can share those experiences. So that's one. Second thing that has happened is there is a rob, complete rob of urban commons. And when I say the complete rob of urban commons, actually I uh, used to run a show on television called The Urban Agenda. Uh, it was a, a, a weekly show, but then the channel got closed because you know we were too radical according to our, our government. Our central government said, no, no, you're too radical. I mean, you shouldn't run such shows. And there I went to Gurgaon, and Gurgaon is that modern uh, city that you can see, which is com uh, what I term as a modern slum. Complete, uh, there were, I think, more than 30 small ponds and lakes completely ruined. They're, so, And we are, finding, we, we are finding movements of the people developing to rejuvenate those. So some of them have completely been usurped. I'm sure Bangalore has similar instances, similar examples, where you know these urban commons have either been usurped and why you saw because that is that is at the, at the hindsight no because cities have to be competitive so how do they become competitive land monetization the practice and i remember in one of the shows when i went to gurgaon uh, we all know shahrukh khan of course we know so uh, so and but we very few of us know that how shahrukh khan became shahrukh khan it's through one of his uh, serials the, the first serial that he did called foji so i was very keen to shoot there because uh, the shooting of that Poggi serial took place in, in one of those lakes. Now, when I went there, Ishwanjas, you'll be shocked to know that lake is completely usurped and there's a real estate building that has come up. And I was told that Shahrukh Khan literally drowned in, in one of those uh, <laughs> one, one of those shoots. So, so you know, th and that's pan India, I'm telling you. Massive. You, you, you go to Gorakhpur, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why these are important in, in election campaigns, because that's how we won. And I told you, no, I mean, how could we win? We, we win uh, uh, Simla, whereas uh, we didn't get that that much uh, majority in the council. I'll, I'll share that. Uh, and before, and if I forget, just remind me, Rishwan, just, okay, before I, so I, I'll just back. So that, that urban commons is very important for alternative politics. And that's how, what is happening. The third is, I mean, what are the alternative solutions? I think that is, uh, uh, so so what alternative solutions and people are actually building those alternative solutions we are finding. But this has also led to the transformation that we are finding three important things that have happened. So that's a very, uh, actually, I mean, I mean, I mean, in political e economic terms, A, inequity has widened just like anything. We just cannot imagine. Uh, I'll just share some of the data. The informalization has increased substantially in our, in our towns. Because when we do alternative politics, what does that mean? When, we, when, when there is informalization, when there is inequity and massive alienation, so there is massive alienation of the people from, you know, city, uh, for democratizing the city from, from, uh, from the city discourse. What do you do in such a situation? When I say inequity, that is one of the fallouts of the way we are building our cities. Uh, I mean, there are many uh, reports. We have the Kini coefficient. We have all, 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 all that stuff. But one report which I have always been quoting is the Oxfam report. And that's something very stark when we do uh, alternative politics. You know, the asset holding capacity, the asset holders in rural and urban India, if we, if we take into account our 10% uh, 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 top asset holders in rural India, the gap is 500 times. But if you take into account the asset holders in uh, the 10% top and the 10% bottom, it is 50,000 times. Just imagine what it is. And we have seen in the pandemic, Rishwan, just how people just fled away. Some of our best cities, the smart cities, you know, uh, and and that's uh, the model. I'll, I'll come to that. So those were the cities where you know you had the first reverse migration taking place. Now alternative politics has to address that. How do we address that? Do we address it with the you know uh, rental housing, labor hostels, 
what is the alternative that we are talking about? I think that's important. So inequity is massive. Informalization, because that's the change metamorphosis that we witness in, in, in the political economy, uh, which was 74% earlier, has actually now jumped to 92% to 93%. What do you do with such an informalization? Earlier, you had the, the formal working people who were part and parcel of even city governance. They could reclaim their spaces. Now that reclaiming uh, spaces and politics is quite gone. So, so it's it's a serious challenge. And that's why when Nashwin was pointing out, you know, students, yes, students are an important uh, area, but students also, you'll find public funded universities and private universities, you can find that stark difference. What do you do in such a situation? I think I'll come to that. Yeah, and we have the halfway mark, so if you could take, you know, one or two minutes to uh, uh, Oh, I, I have not even touched. Okay, so I'll just come to the anecdotes. Sure. Uh, especially, that though, the, especially, so, how, especially how, you know, you were able to win yeah, the yeah. campaign. Yeah. No, Rishwa, that happens, no, when you call a politician, you know, in, <laughs> in <laughs> with technocrat. So you do, okay, I'll try. And the third part is alienation. This massive alienation that we find, especially, and the discourse is such. Your smart cities, and uh, uh, because uh, Ashwin and I, we were there with KC Seva Ramakrishnan, KC had a very interesting uh, word for the smart cities, especially the SPVs that have come up. If I remember correctly, he said it is like writing an obituary of the 74th Constitutional Amendment. So if these are the processes we are witnessing, how do we intervene? A, as I've said, there are no shortcuts. It's a long drawn strategy. B, the larger political parties have every resource at their command, right from psychoanalytic graphics, what Shilpa was talking about. They can even manage and tell you, Rishwanjas, what is the taste of an individual in the constituency? So how do you how do you actually counter uh, counter that? What is the countervailing force? So, in in such a situation, I think how do you actually so those are like two things that I would I would mention and that's that, that I would end with maybe in two days because I had many things maybe I took a uh, uh, longer time somewhere else. Actually, I came from a student's background. I was a student movement uh, activist in in Simla. And it's not that the left has a very large presence, uh, except for we had some associations. You know, we, we work in, in, in an organized fashion, and then we have a different modes, like we have the branches, that's how we work. We have people's organizations, for example, youth, students, that's how we operate. But those are not meant for elections, because our organizations are, you know, built in a different uh, tangent. We are like, you know, transforming the society, what I would have said earlier. So elections is not a priority. But still, uh, two important, uh, uh, actually, uh, anecdotal experiences that I would share, I mean, which really threw us to the limelight and we won in a direct election. Uh, the first was actually, and that's that's the urban commons, Rishwantas. We have a large uh, green meadow called the Annandale Ground. Uh, it's, it's the largest uh, uh, green meadow, and we have very few uh, large green meadows in the mountains. So that large meadow was being usurped by, uh, he's a present minister in the union uh, cabinet, and his son was the chief minister in the state, and he's very fond of you know building those cricket stadiums. So he wanted to construct a cricket. I, I mean, I can tell you the name. I mean, Rag Thakur. He wanted to construct a cricket stadium there, and he has that habit of constructing a five-star hotel. So there was this movement, and presently that ground is with the army, and he said, no, no, the army must move. It's not for the golfers, so it should go back to the people. And he wanted to create a, a cricket stadium. The people didn't want that because people knew that this is a green meadow, so. Uh, and there was an alternative campaign. There was a campaign from the government, and there was an alternative campaign from the people. And you know, it was the city was vertically divided. Large section of the of the city came in support of us when we built the movement, and we gave a slogan: "Neither for the for the golfers nor for the cricket mafia." Okay, that's the slogan we we coined. The stadium must belong to the people, and actually, we were able to push that, push them back. They had to uh, retreat. This the green meadow still exists. That's the first thing, okay? So we were able to catch the imagine. So that's the point. I mean, you can't just, so when you're talking about the city, it has to be pan city approach. I mean, that's that's another thing that I wanted to add. The second one was DLF trying to enter into a forest and then constructing some cottages. Now, Simla has this, uh, you know, maybe this is what we have imbibed since uh, since decades together. Actually, uh, the, 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 the common citizens in Simla have that, a great love for forest and green cover. And they do not want, uh, you know, that green cover to be shed that easily. So when DLF tried to intervene and actually chop down some of the trees, we were actually uh, agitating on the roads. 
and till date i mean imagine i think that was uh, in 2008 or 9 till date they have not been able to hand over the position to the to the so called cottage owners so that uh, that's so we were able to catch them and just the last thing is shwan just i must tell you so this is old woman when we were fighting this annandale battle and this old woman called she said i have never voted for you party in fact i have always been a boss because she was a hotelier and we've been running unions in the hotel so you know there was, there was always this confrontation between the hotel yeah. workers and the hotel owners and she said but we always treated you as a nuisance but you are the ones who can really check i think uh, tikender ji has dropped off uh, he had given us a heads up about his uh, uh, internet connection so i think he was in his concluding uh, remarks while we wait for him to uh, join back i'll just quickly uh, you know move into the um, q and a uh, that we had uh, planned um, i'll just pick it up from the uh, chat box it may be uh, you know begin with um, Uh, I think yeah, he's, he's I would, with that I think maybe there was some problem with my network can you hear me sure 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 I can yeah, hear you can I think I would yeah. end with that so I think so so yeah there is a space there is a scope for alternative but that oh, those alternatives can't come overnight rich ones they have to be built they have to be nurtured over the time and it cannot be diverse from your politics from your economics they have to be quite embedded in what you plan they have to be quite embedded in what you think and i am not a gandhian by the way but i believe in the gandhian philosophy what you preach and practice should be diverse from each other actually uh, you know what i'm saying i mean you can't be just professional uh, in, poli- in 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 politics and managing the elections and doing the reverse in your daily lives i don't i don't buy it that with that maybe we can keep pushing great um, that's a wide range of you know issues for us to uh, look at and consider especially i would flag in my mind the importance of issue based campaigns because that's something we've been having a discussion of late um going back um to the questions that i pick up and frame from one of the uh, chat box we'll be start off with ashwin sir um the importance of municipal elections in building political leaders of the future this is something we have spoken about before and uh, it's something that's often uh, found its place in such conversations so what do you think really separates the experience of being a candidate in the municipal elections or being a, a political uh, representative at the city level as compared to the larger state or national elections what is it that's different in these elections that really um, shape you as a candidate or your experiences well you know the municipal election um, is not organized in the same way everywhere in india in some places it, in all places you have wards and councillors elected to wards but the leadership of the municipality is not always elected in the same way in some places they are elected indirectly by the ward councillors themselves after the election and in other places the mayor deputy mayor chairperson people like that heads of the municipal bodies are elected directly by the people themselves in some places the elections are conducted on a party basis with affiliation to a party being part of the nomination and campaign in some places they are uh conducted on a non party basis so that on the ballot you don't really see the logos of the political party even though everybody knows who is from which party or at least a lot of people know who is from which party not everybody knows broadly because of this i think that and also the municipal constituency the ward uh is subject to a much higher degree of repeated delimitation and reservation than the state or national constituencies because of this the municipal space is by and large a churning space and it is 
very difficult for an alternate politics to emerge through the leadership of an individual. It almost certainly has to be the, the alternate politics of a party itself. You saw in Tekender's description, he said that he was able to win the direct deputy mayor's contest, but his party had only two councillors in, in the council. So there is, a, there, is, there is a challenge in mounting a sufficiently large campaign to capture municipal leadership power uh, except in an organized way across the entire municipal space by a political party. Here and there, you could get charismatic and proven people to win individual posts, but they invariably end up having to work without the necessary larger support at the ward levels as well. Uh, and Tamil Nadu and UP and a few other states have had direct elections to mayors. And some of them have also gone back and forth between direct elections and indirect elections and all of that thing. Some, um, I don't even know if all states have five-year mayors or maybe some states have four-year mayors, I don't know. But broadly, there are differences. And these differences more or less ensure that municipal leadership is not a continuous opportunity for anybody. That, um, and this is also why people try to maintain the proxy for their continuous leadership by saying, my mother, my wife, my husband, my son will take my place and somehow, you know, in, in a constituency based on reservation changes and things like that. And parties also try to elbow some candidates out of the space by changing the reservations. So I don't think today that it is possible for an individual to emerge as a new leader by doing things in the municipal space within a ward. But it is possible for somebody who has done things in a larger than ward space to become a serious contestant in a ward. So it, in some sense, if you're well known, you can contest the ward election in your space and be powerful in that. But the ward itself doesn't unfortunately provide enough opportunity to become a launch pad for anything that is larger. And, and if you look back at the history of the 74th Amendment, uh, there was always a debate about the 74th Amendment that we needed to fix both leadership and representation in urban poli in local politics. The 73rd and the 74th Amendment, I think, have done a reasonable job of fixing representation. More people feel included in the leadership of local councils and panchayats today than ever before. But I think we achieved that at the cost of leadership in local councils and panchayats. Um, and, and I think, therefore, you end up with a scenario in which the MLAs are not only in larger geographic spaces, but they're also in politically more important spaces. We have to sort of overcome that in due course. Um, and in cities like Bangalore, where the mayor changed every year, frankly, the mayor was tokenism at best. And they're trying to change some of that. But also in, in large urban areas, there's another problem that in large urban areas, what happens in your constituency is often determined to some degree by things around you as well. And increasingly metropolitan areas are multi-municipal. That Bangalore is an exception to this thing, but if you go to Chennai or Kolkata or Mumbai, there are many municipalities in the metropolitan area. And in some sense, they are to be governed together, but in another sense, they're actually competition to each other. So all of this is playing out in a, in a you know, churn. Some of that churn is healthy and good, but some of that churn is chaotic and holds back development. Great. Thanks. Um, I've been receiving a, a set of questions. I'll pick and choose uh, based on what fits into that context. Before I throw open the same question to our other panelists, let me add one more. Um, the first question, of course, was uh, what is the differential role that the municipal elections play in shaping a candidate or their experiences as compared to larger elections? The second question that I want to add on is this idea of um, municipal elections seeing lower turnout than the larger elections. It's been raised by quite a few people even today. How do you as a candidate, um, if you have been in that space or hypothetically, 
if you are a candidate who is facing an election in the wake of a uh, known low voter turnouts how do you address that do you look at that as some sort of opportunity because you know which is the section that's going to vote and which section you have to cater to or do you look at that as maybe a, an opportunity in a different sense that you have to reach out to people who have not been voting so as a candidate do you look at that as an opportunity a strength a weakness so these two questions um, that i throw open uh, before coming back to uh, ashwin sir if um, mr shilpa or mr tikender want to go ahead and answer them the first question was on uh, this uh, level and um, the, the level of municipal elections and the experience and the second question was on how you look at low voter turnout i think um, tikender ji is unmuted but we can't hear you he's on mute we we can't hear you can you hear me now yeah your audio is back yeah yeah so uh, can you just repeat that question because i just couldn't comprehend what you said uh my question was on particularly low voter turnouts when you're as, as a candidate if you're facing an election when you know that there are uh, historically low voter turnouts uh, voter turnouts at the municipal level do you look at that as an opportunity how do you address that do you focus on people who have not been voting and try to get them to vote for the first time or do you restrict yourself to people who've just shown the patterns of voting no i think uh, i will uh, try to put it in a larger context the low voter turnout is also part of that larger uh, uh, thing that i said no it's alienation actually people say hey we be jeet kar i mean the same person will win yaar or the other person nothing is going to happen so you know that nothing is going to happen phenomenon is very strong and and that has been actually very deliberately and purposely done and that's why you find that entire structure that has come up no spbs and all where uh, where is there is democrat i mean democratic control i mean tell me any place maybe bangalore you, you i i heard some ward sabhas where people are actually engaged and and where where you understand people's uh, engagement taking place in decision making else it's it's a completely different ball game so i think that's one of the reasons now as a candidate if i have to contest why should i not ask i mean i, I mean i think i would like more people to come i mean if if i'm really imbibed to that ideology of of course winning is very important but at the same time uh and you know one of the exercises that we do i i am sure the others will also be doing is to actually map the voters list and you, this was always a tussle ashwin knows that because uh, uh for example now let me be very categorical in stating that your informal sector workers your especially in simla i can tell you your muslim porters who come from kashmir rishwan just it used to take us days and weeks together to get them registered as voters and they used to carry seven id cards so you know that informal sector the marginalized section who i know are going to vote for me because i represent them in various forms and not just in elections but even otherwise i mean whenever they whenever whenever there is an issue that so you know more issue based so i think that is also very important when we contest elections i mean we have to see what is the constituency whether part of that constituency so you will find large section of the people are not even elector uh, i mean part of the electorate you know so every i mean whenever the whenever the, so i, I and uh, so uh, so whenever there is this revision of the electoral uh, rolls this used to be a very major task before us to get the voters registered and you will find all of, all of a sudden 50% 40% of of these unorganized sectors and who are, who are actually living in some of the labor hostels uh, run by the municipal corporation are completely out so yeah i think uh, uh, i mean it is important that we have uh, i mean but one of the reasons why people don't because they don't trust and why they don't trust because this quite there's an alienation here yeah? so you know reclaiming how do they reclaim their right i mean that is what the alternative politics have to think about and that's not a one uh, night ordeal i mean that's that's a continuous process continuous phenomenon and various ways linking you know uh, what accrue to them out of uh, the municipal and it does i mean it it, it does make a difference for example Uh, uh let let me speak again about those kashmiri reporters i mean forget about large things when we went uh, uh, in the campaign they said we don't sub i don't know whether people will understand hindi there so we don't want anything else the only thing that we want get the porters after every 200 meters i want a resting place where i can put my load rest and then climb you know in the mountains 
and most of these resting places have been occupied by by many many people so you know that was also an important so so them voting in the elections was not much because they didn't vote what what so for them it was a small small demand that their resting places must be secured back so how do you reclaim uh, and that that reclamation has to happen through various phases i think that that's all i would say yeah uh, ashwin sir your take on the low voter turnout how to so, approach them i mean i don't think it's really what low voter turnout or high voter turnout it's it's about your voter turnout versus other people's voter turnout. I don't care if only 10% of the people come if they are voting for me. Um, so, so I, I, and I think that's a perfectly political stance to take. But yes, on, in general, we would like higher voter turnout. But I don't think the political parties are agreed on this. Because if they were in favor of higher voter turnout, there are things that can be done in municipal elections that other countries are now starting to do and, that, and even have done that we could be doing. Um, for example, you could say that municipal elections, residents can vote. You don't actually have to be a citizen or a voter. You, you need to be I mean, not a citizen. You don't have to be a citizen whose voting is in that uh, constituency. As long as you have a voter ID from anywhere in India, you should be allowed to vote in a municipal election. You could do something like that, right? And these are things, in fact, in other countries, in some places, they've even gone to the extent of saying, if you're a resident, you can vote. You're not, you don't even require, you don't even need to be a citizen because there is an understanding that the municipal election is a civic thing. It has got nothing to do with, with you know, the national discourse or the state discourse. Perhaps that will take much longer to arrive into every geography. But even without that, there are other things that can be done. Certainly anybody having a voter ID anywhere in India could be empowered to vote um, in any local election where they, are, they have addressed me, for example. So that's one thing you can do. But the other thing, and here, you know, again, there even CPM, I felt missed out an opportunity that in the mid to around 2002, 2004, whatever, no, 2005, six even, I'm going to say, when the conversation about proportionate representation was going on, I believe that, you know, both the Congress and the CPM lost an opportunity to support a different way of counting the vote. See, everybody talks about getting voters to come, but elections are not won merely by how you vote. Elections are won by how they count. Right? The count, if you have a transferable first preference voting system in India, you will get a very different election result mm -hmm. than what you are getting in the first past the post system. Yeah. But political, even when, when this was put even to Mrs. Gandhi eight, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, Congress was completely unwilling to support proportionate representation. And Congress was, and that's ironic because with 15, 20% vote share, Congress should have a hundred seats in parliament. The, and, and similarly, yeah, I think true. even the left parties have enough vote share to get more seats in parliament across all of India. But because you did not support proportionate representation, you ended up in a situation where the first past the post system is working against you. So I actually think that the thresholds for new ideas to emerge through elections ha have become worse than they were in the past. And even if you succeed, it is not greatly representative. There was a member of parliament from UP two Lok Sabhas ago who lost his deposit. I mean, he got less than one sixth of the vote and he lost his deposit, but he had got more votes than anybody else. And therefore, he was the MP. So I think we have to think seriously about how we are selecting people through the electoral process, that we are completely ignoring the importance of that in how we assess elections. Um, I, I think that unless that changes, so if you have proportionate representation, nobody will say my vote is wasted because they know that the vote is contributing to aggregate vote share. We have eliminated the importance of vote share in support of ideas. Unless you bring back vote share in support of ideas, the, this feeling that my vote is useless will persist. Yeah, I think I agree. I agree with this, Ashwin, 100 percent that actually the, the entire processes of uh, actually how do we elect. And uh, it's not that, Ashwin, I hope you, you are aware that it's, we, are, we strongly advocate this, uh, I mean, the proportional representation system. It's just that, I mean, you couldn't prioritize in that period. I mean, all that I would say, I mean, as a, as a and there are many things, I mean, that we couldn't do, definitely. But 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. First pass was yeah, um, not fair. That that's some um, interesting uh, points. Uh, coming back, yeah, uh, Shilpa, ma'am, do you want to take um, this yes. question? See, or the one before, yeah. So you uh, know these vote shares. What you are talking, I uh, know we are talking here. Okay, as a candidate, as a leader, it is very important to focus because there are certain things. Uh, know when a candidate is uh, campaigning or trying to understand our voters, we leave these thirty percent voters unheard. Okay, so we need to hear them. So how do we do it? Okay, see, so we have to. That's where these technology or what we called uh, data science will come into the place. It's it's a right place to reach these people, hear their, you know, what is their, you know, sentiments, what are their issues. We need to go deep, root down, you know, root values of their voters, and then bring out such inferences. What is making them not vote, and what will make them vote. so what will make them vote is certain things a leader has to focus on and this could be at any level hmm? so when we get all these inferences in place probably we can get focused and try to solve their issues okay and that that level this is the grassroots level when we reach out these grassroots level issues probably we could get a, a better results in our voting patterns so that's what i would like to say you know rishi i and which yeah. i want to say uh, you here with even tikender referred to there is a risk in treating elections as a techno managerial process this is not about the mechanics of the race elections should be primarily about the purpose of the race right and where if uh, there is uh, one of the things that has happened is uh, shilpa is right in pointing out that in many other countries there is um, sophistication in how data is collected and understood and how campaigns target people based on their preferences um and expressed preferences and discovered preferences to win elections and i think yes some that's bound to happen in fact some of that is happening quite powerfully um in india already but i think that that's actually making things worse is for the moment is not making things better it's allowing political parties to go appeal to narrower and narrower segments of people who already agree with them and try to maximize voter turnout in that subgroup rather that is number one so essentially it has become uh, what ought to be a contest for ideas has become a contest between people among neighbors and among sort of in a way that was never the original purpose of democracy the second is that it this kind of competition can easily become disengaged from what ideas and ideologies and goals you are trying to pursue right if 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 the if the mechanics are the thing that are important then it doesn't matter very little whether you are trying to grow the economy or shrink the economy it 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 only matters who who is capable of winning so i i i know a lot of people in the political campaign of the you know, consulting space and i try to work with some of them at least to say look be be smart about who you providing this consulting for but i find that too many people are providing such consulting services for candidates that they don't even agree with because there is a, a market for that okay um i will now um, move on to club two questions that have come with the common theme being entry barrier uh, to being candidates in the municipal elections uh, the first part is um looking at all the challenges that are there in politics including monetary which specifically at the local bbmp level municipal level where the salary allowances are really low and if you need to survive in this as um, you know something that you want to do for a living then you might have to engage in practices that you might not necessarily believe in so the first part is out for someone who's educated maybe spent a lot of money on their education looking at municipal governance as a livelihood being a representative as a form of full time job uh what are the challenges to that 
um, is it really sustainable for someone educated to take the plunge? That's part number one. And the second part is um, just how serious a challenge, we know that it's a challenge, but how serious a challenge is nepotism um, for a candidate fighting, say, issue-based campaigns and elections at the municipal level as compared to the larger election. So we know it's an issue, but how serious is the issue and how different is it at the municipal level versus the larger level? So these are the two questions. I can maybe uh, check with Tikendraji first and then come back to uh, Shilpa ma'am and Ashwin sir. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, am I, am I audible? Okay, the yes. first thing monetary criteria, and you know, I don't think that uh, this would further exclude uh, if, if uh, education becomes one of the criteria because uh, you know, going by the landscape, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I have seen, I mean, doesn't uh, really qualify that what someone who's uh, too educa educated uh, would be a very good performer. I mean, so uh, I, don't, I, I have not really come across uh, that. Uh, but there's one more thing that uh, we really have to work. I don't, I don't have solutions, by the way, for that. And probably Ashwinji uh, must come in coming from a different background. And you know that uh, uh, because the candidates spend almost, I mean, we just finished uh, four municipal corporations uh, in Himachal. And can you believe uh, someone spending one crore rupees? And if you think uh, economic criteria sustainability, that bugger is never going to earn the same from, from that. So, so, you know, that justification, so I, am, uh, I'm, I don't have actually an answer to that. Uh, but I just want to share some of the experiences. Now, take for example, someone coming from if I mean someone contesting from my party, even if one gets elected, I don't know how many of our uh, uh, participants are aware that whatever I used to get uh, as a deputy mayor and even the mayor, uh, that has to be had to be parted to the party. I mean that's that's the way how we work, and then a wage used to be drawn, and that's how our member of parliaments also function. I don't know whether that's a sustainable model, but that's what we've been doing. We've been wanting. I don't profess that to be, I mean, I mean, I can understand people who buy that argument. That's what we do. I mean, so we just part the entire wage and then whatever wage is given to our whole time functionary gets paid to our elected representative also. Uh, so, so there's just two contexts I'm, 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 I'm sharing, Vishwan. So A, that education, I don't, I don't find that, but it's definitely a complex stream. It's a very, for example, Delhi, uh, the arm of the party has been able to justify and I do not really contest that part. That look, uh, and I think that's how they have enhanced the uh, the wages of uh, their MLAs. Uh, but I think it's it's a domain more to be explored. Uh, uh, and I don't say that uh, the Delhi Amati Party MLAs uh, uh, are corrupt. I, mean, I, I, I at least I can see their functioning. I mean, I can see the stark difference that uh, exists. Um, of course. Uh, so, so this nexus that exists, uh, uh, and, and that's why I said Ashwinji, Ashwinji must uh, point it out. You know, when we were running the, uh, when we were serving the city government, and as I've told you, almost 85% were the non, the, I mean, left representatives. So good nexus exists between, you know, what is the work to be assigned and what would be the share of the corporator. And that, that is something across India. And larger municipalities, I'm told Mumbai, it runs into crores. So even 10% to 20% of the share. But how do you break that? We tried to do something, but we didn't succeed much. For example, we said only through the ward Sabha. So any project that comes, uh, any developmental work that comes from the ward has to be rooted through a ward Sabha. And if it is not rooted through the ward Sabha, because at least the file had to come to us, we would not approve it. So they had to bear us. So at least what Sabha has started taking place. And uh, so, you know, at least we could we could find some check and some check and balance. But our council was so smart that after three months, because every three months the what Sabha had to be repeated, the same signatures were forged and again, the projects were coming in the same form. So I, so I think can an alternative politics to that, I mean, maybe if, uh, uh, Bangalore is trying, even when one is elected, I mean, because this is not, you know, election, to the, to the councillor doesn't mean empowering the councillor. It means empowering the people. Actually, what is also happening is the one who's winning is like amassing lots of wealth. So I think that, and, and there is no criteria for that. I mean, the, uh, 
So you can find more educative, I mean, extremely brilliant in amassing that wealth, and even the less educative doing the same. How do we break, break that? I mean, I have anecdotal experiences when we went out for, for, uh, for, for a tour. So that's another, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, play. I mean, I don't want to. I mean, where you know, you, you you'll be shown cities which you can you cannot implement an iota of that, but still you'll be spending money on taking your counselors to Singapore and all that stuff. And then this guy who was a counselor from Madhya Pradesh, Bhopal, he bought three large-scale televisions, and and I couldn't imagine. I mean, what is it? One he had to put on my name. So and so he was a real estate giant in in Bhopal. So we find, I mean, there's this strong kind of connection. How do we break that? Uh, there are no easy ways. I think it's more people's uh, participation where they are able to check. I, I mean, I'm really clueless about that because five years that I got, I can just share what has happened. What has improved is, I think, uh, still uh, still long way to go. And the second thing, uh, nepotism. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Definitely, these are very uh, relevant issues. I mean, I mean, why why don't we know? I mean, we are aware of all that, no? Uh, uh, I mean, who's to get a get a seat? I mean, who's to contest? Uh, what are the what what are the ways in which uh, all, uh, I mean, one gets a ticket? Um, uh, I mean, we are aware of that. Uh, but but uh, I don't think I have to add much on that. But it, it's a serious challenge, definitely. It's a serious challenge. But I don't find any problem with nepotism. I mean, I mean, in case the person is able and the person is is able to work well. Because someone has to contest, no, and that's what Ashwin was pointing out. You know, the, uh, apart from the first pass for the system, I mean, the proportional representation. Can we just think? Of, and that's why Ashwin. I mean, it's a very utopian thing that I would like to share with you. You know, we had the first urban commission when Charles Corey was getting that. It's 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 actually now we definitely require a second urban commission. I don't know whether that will happen, but at least if we, we can't try uh, 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 proportional representation in a parliament and state legislatures. I think, the, and if a fourth schedule, I mean, from the union list, state list, and current list, I mean, if we are able to really raise this dialogue, at least let's try this. Uh, like we, we've tried women reservation uh, in, in the local bodies. I think th this this is something where we have to engage at larger platforms. Yeah, uh, Ashwin, so your response to that, since it was addressed uh, to you as well, part uh, of the answer. You know, I hear that uh, the, the next urbanization commission is in the works and could emerge anytime in the next few weeks. Let's wait and see what that happens. It's unlikely that people like you or I will agree with much of what goes into that uh, commission, but be that as it may. Um, I think, look, there are two ways of approaching this whole thing. Either you are trying to fight what is bad or you are trying to help what is good. Right? Just, I'm just, I, I, I know these words are too stark sometimes in, in gray areas, but let's take this as two sides of the same coin. You want to you want to make things, you want to support things that are good and you want to sort of defeat things that are bad in some way. The question is, where should the majority of your effort go? Should you spend a lot of effort trying to defeat the bad guys or you should, should you try to spend a lot of effort somehow making good things more and more powerful? And I think there's no uniform answer to that. And I think it's also simplistic to say, well, you need both. Of course you need both. That, that's obvious, right? That's like saying you need to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, yes. But that doesn't tell you, you know, anything more than just that. Um, so my, my assessment of that is that in campaign mode, it is important to have a sharper focus on defeat, defeating what is bad. In governance mode, it is better to have a sharper focus on strengthening what is good. That is, you have to work with the assumption that the elected representative is a decent fellow. And you, he may not be, but the way to tackle that is not always to sort of just try and pull him back or constrain him in public office. You can empower another set of people who's generally you can empower a Lokpal, an anti-corruption bureau or all of that. There are systematic procedures for that. But I'm saying if you really want to tackle the guy, try and make him lose the next election. Right? Don't think that your anti-corruption bureau and the Lokayakta are going to be able to do their jobs powerfully unless there is a political movement on the ground as well that is supportive of that. Of course, these institutions exist in many states. Um, it's 
whether they function properly is really determined by who sort of directs them. So uh, the, the way I would, the, the real entry barrier is not, um, so a lot of people think of entry barrier in terms of what if I were an independent candidate that did not want to associate with any of these people and therefore my entry barriers are high. Frankly, if you did not want to associate with anybody else, I would discourage you from coming into politics itself in the first place. Uh, the whole idea of representative politics is that you first form a critical mass of people who want advocacy for something and they together determine how to take it forward through candidates that they select and elect. Uh, so this notion that uh, a standalone candidate on her own or his own should be able to get support from a wider group after deciding to plunge into it, it's sort of, you know, it's contrary to the construct itself that organization before campaign is how I would see it, that you don't organize yourself after deciding to get into the campaign. And nepotism, yeah, and there is nepotism. Uh, I, I, I think it can be, I, I think, look, there's nepotism of a, a certain kind. There's a nepotism of a kind that says, my son should follow me, my, my whatever, my daughter should follow me. That's a kind of nepotism. Or my, someone I know well should take my spot. I'm willing to step, step down as chief minister if somebody I know has made the chief minister or like speech. So we've seen all these kinds of nepotisms. I actually think that we should have term limits that nobody should serve in a public office, the same public office for more than two terms. It is not necessary. No one in the country is so valuable that they are needed to serve more than two terms in any public office. If they are really valuable, they can cut to some other public office and serve two more terms there if they want to, right? I feel term limits are useful. Term limits also bring courage. Politicians don't need to worry that if they do the right thing for the right reasons, they may get defeated. If they cannot run again anyway, they will sometimes do the right things for the right reasons. Now everybody is worried about the next election and they're all opposed to term limits, but, and this is exactly the reason why you need it. Got it. Uh, the time is now past uh, 7.30. So we are, uh, you know, uh, past our uh, concluding time. Um, what I will do right now that we've been able to cover most questions and themes, but not all, but I still think that uh, we've, you know, uh, done um, uh, the, the task of at least touching upon various issues and hopefully left um, our listeners with some questions, uh, something that has sparked somewhere. So we can conclude with maybe uh, uh, just a one minute uh, conclusion or takeaways or anything if the panelists might uh, want to say anything based on, you know, the last 90 minutes of conversation discussion. So anybody uh, in the panel could just go ahead. Um, sure. So Rishi, uh, the first uh, question, uh, no, which uh, you just uh, spoke about and where uh, my, no, Ashwin sir, and uh, I just raised it on uh, no, the technology, it will be the, uh, no, the, the, that was the discussion there. So here the topic was more about the participation of the voters and not to bring the vote to discuss on the technology and part of it. Okay, so uh, political consultants, they have their own uh, no, work to do behind the campaigns. So that should not be you know, quite uh, no, correlated and then come to kind of conclusion you know, to the results. Uh, anyway, then the second question here is about uh, uh, no, how the leaders you know, without much support Okay, or uh, uh, having a, uh, no, a nepotism around them will help contest the election. See, the example is me, like, you know, I, I do not come from a political background. Okay, and uh, I uh, want to bring in some change. I like to serve people. Okay, having certain things, ideologies in my mind, you know, I have stepped into this world okay of politics now how do i do that is i really need to sit down and sort out you know one by one thinking you know how to defeat my opponent so let it let it be you know whoever uh, right um, so inside me should be i want to be a leader now how do i do that so i use various services which is available for me 
okay before that i ask myself am i really capable enough to do this or you know take this kind of a step hmm? and focus on my voters and their issues so this is the grassroots so i've been telling grassroots level is what you know uh, talk to your voters you no know? reach them out reach to the influences at your uh, ward level you know booth level and then get a hold on you know these people you know what you want to do what is the change you want to bring in then later things you know they they can see through you it's not something uh, somebody is giving money and you just vote these things will not go for a long time get it yeah so somebody so, you no know, they will assess you now i think today voters are so intelligent enough now they are not like uh, you no know, last 10 years what we see now they are assessing you as a leader no uh, whether they are talking their own words or are they talking their fathers or brothers or sisters x y z who is come from the family okay right? so now that's where we have a wider chance as a new uh, you no know, new face okay to this political uh, era what's coming in that's yeah. where we need to make our better stand and not uh, make uh, no reach reach out to them great thanks uh, any concluding remarks from your end tikender ji um that's it uh thank you i think but uh, i think rishwan just for what we need to understand at the macro level is this you know this is a kind of transformation phase in which our cities are passing through it so is politics unfortunately the discourse presently uh, uh, what ashwin ji was just mentioning that if this urban commission is coming probably people like him and i would be completely uh, alienated from that and you know the reasons why that is so so the discourse is for more alienation i mean look at the tools that are being created for uh, for running city governance so but this also gives a space for that alternative uh, politics and the alternative politics to reclaim when i say reclaim not just reclaim urban commons but reclaim whatever is ours and it's through different ways and i think polity means all of that and elections is one of the forms in which we can reclaim what 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 is ours and uh, um, uh, i think that that that's it yeah yeah great thanks dr ashwin mahesh concluding remarks from your side well very little to say additionally i hope the kender one day we will see you back in a public elected office again and i hope you will support uh, up candidates in the uttarakhand elections that are coming and uh, i think this is an interesting and important time uh, for the the changes that we all want to bring about in governance and through elections between 2010 and 2013 we had a three year period in which there was a, a lot of churn and some things emerged from that that have set a new direction for the last decade and that's really why i focused on the last decade is that some things did churn because of the anti corruption campaign uh and not necessarily following on from the campaign itself but because of the campaign and one day we can discuss all of that separately but um, but equally i think we are in for another 3 year period between 2021 and 2024 in which you are going to see more tipping points in the political spectrum and while it's difficult to say exactly what will emerge from that i i think we are now in a cycle is it's, it's almost like um, intel developing microprocessor chips now right the development and product cycles for our politics are also accelerating that you are going to see a churn in how rapidly reimagination of this thing is demanded again and again and really all of us have to put our faith in that and say if we go through 3 to 5 turns of that then there's a chance of becoming something other than where we are now it will take four doublings of the economy to become even a middle income country and four doublings of the economy even at 7 or 8% growth rate will take 55 years right we are in really comparatively speaking a bad situation and that unless we find ways to innovatively and cataclysmically change that you're in for the long haul that you so you have to ask yourself what is going to make a dramatic transformation possible not just a linear incremental progress and i think politics provides that space 
Great. Thank you so much to all of you for being part of uh, this ambitious idea that we had uh, before we you know, start, put together this panel. We may not have gone all the way in terms of our objectives, but we've definitely come uh, a fair distance. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and um, I will uh, reach out to everyone and let you know once the talk is up on the internet. See you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.